last four or five pages are a couple of articles that I wrote a few years ago. I'd like you to read that. Um, whatever handouts we distribute in class, I'd like you to read those again sometime on your own. Um, writing, I'd like you to write an answer to all the questions as much as time will allow. We'll work through those questions as review. Um, it's not a secret. But did you know that in the Bible geography book, all the answers are in bold print in, in the paragraphs? <laughs> I found out the old-fashioned way because I'm going to be teaching one class uh, one night when Brother Ron is gone. And so I was working through typing out my answers. And the next thing I know when I'm looking up the answers, they're in bold print. So there you go. And so then a listing. Uh, the next to last class on the 14th, I'd like you to bring in the list, not of 22 things, not of seven, but 10 things you learn about God in the book of Daniel. Please don't Google it. Please, please don't rely on somebody else. Don't outsource it to somebody. Just when you're reading through, what you might do is when you're doing your reading through the book of Daniel, just keep up. Uh, maybe some of you have a pad, maybe some of you have a paper. Just write down something you learn about God and then pick ten things out of it. It's a fascinating study. Okay? Tonight we're going to introduce the book and, and look at the contents of chapter 1. Chapter 1 is a really straightforward chapter. There are things in the book of Daniel with which even little kiddos are familiar, right? I mean, who's spent any time in Bible class and hadn't heard about Moses in the lion's den, right? Uh, at least one person's list. Yeah, Daniel in the lion's den. And who's not been to Bible class and not learned about Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah being tossed into the fiery furnace? And so those are some events, genuine historical events that are recorded in this book. Now, the first six chapters or the first half of the book, it's more along those lines and you throw in a couple of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams which are explained, and don't you like that? When you got a dream and then an explanation. And then when you get to chapter 7, it's like, whoa, this is like, this is, this is different. Some of the literature in the book of Daniel is called apocalyptic literature. That's a you know, a ten dollar word on page six at the top of the page as we look at the outline apocalyptic section. What, pray tell, is apocalyptic? I'm not trying to be weird in the way I pronounce that. I just have to slow down to make sure I'm saying it properly. What does that mean, apocalyptic literature? End of time. It's, it's basically language that involves symbols, figures, visions, signs. Um, other books in the Bible that, that involve that type of literature would be Old Testament Ezekiel, Zechariah. In other words, it's a message given in pictures, so to speak. And it's our task as Bible students to figure out what that picture means. Now, sometimes, and know you love them, huh? There are some instances in the Bible where you have this vision or this figure, and then the Bible gives you the explanation and say, boy, I'm thankful for that. And the other book of the Bible is the book of Revelation. And so what you'll find is, if you're really familiar with these symbols in the book of Ezekiel and the book of Daniel and the book of Zechariah, when you've studied those and you come over in the book of Revelation, some of those symbols are repeated and you say, aha, I'm familiar with this thing. I read this back in the Old Testament and I saw what it meant back then. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Now, to whom was that message written? These things were written for our learning. To whom was that written? Yeah, it, it applies to us. It originally was written to the saints in Rome, Romans 15, verse 4. So the things that were written aforetime would be what? Old Testament. And he says, 
these things are written for our learning. What's these three words? That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have what? Oh, oh. Now that's Romans 15. Oh. If you don't close your Bible there and you read the next verse, Romans 15, 5, and you drop down and read verse 13, you know what you learn about the God of heaven? He's the God of patience, He's the God of comfort, and He's the God of hope. You reckon there's any connection between the Scriptures giving us patience, comfort, and hope, and the God of heaven being the God of comfort, patience, and hope? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. In general, we often make this observation. And I think it's accurate. If one was to try in a nutshell to give the theme of the entire Old Testament from Genesis 1 to Malachi 4, in general, what's the message of the Old Testament? In general, you don't just, just get a few words. Right? Yeah, the Messiah's coming. Someone's coming. The Messiah or, or New Testament language of the Greeks, Christ is coming. Now here, here's an interesting observation, and we've got it here in our booklet on, on page number two. I don't know what version of Bible you're using, but in the English Old Testament, if you're reading from the New King James or the King James, let's stop right there. If you're studying or using the King James or New King James, in the English Old Testament, the word Messiah is found in only one book of the Bible. And it is the book of Daniel, chapter 9. The American Standard Version of 1901 does not have the word Messiah. It translates it. Well, when you translate Messiah into English, what do you get? Anointed one. And the American Standard has the anointed one. A number of people these days are using the English, the ESV, the English Standard Version. It has, instead of Messiah, it has an anointed one. Okay. Well, in those Old Testament prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, though the word Messiah in most cases is not used, in connection with his coming, there's also this idea that he will establish a what? A kingdom. Is that kingdom mentioned in the book of Daniel? Sure is. Yeah. In the days of these kings, Brother Ron stole some of our thunder, right? In the days of these kings, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom or establish a kingdom that shall never what? Be never be destroyed. The kingdom of God. So, so in the book of Daniel, you have specific prophecy about the coming Messiah, and you have specific prophecy about the coming kingdom. Now, we're going to spend some time tonight. We're going to try not to overwhelm ourselves. But to, to find out where the message of Daniel fits in, we've got to consider at least some historical matters. Now, Isaiah, in general terms, Isaiah was a prophet of Jehovah about 100 years before Daniel served as a prophet. And in the book of Isaiah, there are numerous references to Babylon. Okay? Babylon's a big factor in the book of Daniel. You agree with that? Chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. Chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. Chapter 3, Babylon. Chapter 4, Babylon. Chapter 5, Babylon. Chapter 7, Babylon. Chapter 8, Babylon. So Babylon's a big factor. If you look at our book, on page number two, the very last paragraph, in the days of King Hezekiah, Isaiah made this declaration. He said, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come, that all that is in that house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left Say a little couple of observations here. First of all, when Hezekiah was on the throne in Judah, the big power of the Middle East was not Babylon. Babylon had, had not yet become a mighty power. Instead, it was the empire that preceded the Babylonians, which would be which empire? 
series. A series. But as Brother Ron mentioned, okay, as Brother Ron mentioned, some in Babylon were trying to get some independence, and so when Hezekiah was on the throne, the king of Babylon sent some messengers over to Judah. And when they came to Hezekiah, Hezekiah basically opened his door and showed them what? Everything he had. And so Isaiah said, King, what have they seen in your house? And Isaiah said, well, I showed them everything. And that's where this prophecy comes in. We just read here in our booklet. He said, that, that's, that's something. You showed these folks from Babylon everything you got. <laughs> One of these days, Babylon's going to take everything you got to Babylon. And he went on to say, not only that, he's going to take some of your male offspring, and King Hezekiah, your male offspring are going to be made eunuchs in Babylon. Well, guess what we read in Daniel chapter 1? That's right. Jewish young men made eunuchs. Over Babylon. We'll, we'll not go into it, but Isaiah has so many things to say. Here, here's, how, here's how Isaiah described Babylon before Babylon ever became a power. He said Babylon is the beauty or the glory of kingdoms. In other words, Babylon was something else. But he also tells us, Isaiah tells us, Jeremiah tells us, who are going to be the ones that are going to combine their forces to overthrow Babylon. Who's that going to be? The Medes and the Persians. And they're going to be mentioned by name in the book of Daniel. So, so, so Daniel is, is going to give us some historical references. But by the Holy Spirit, he's going to be able to give out messages that pertain to world events in the days of the Babylonians who were followed up by the Medo-Persians who were followed up by the Greeks. And all three of those are mentioned by name in the book of Daniel. Babylonians are mentioned in the book of Daniel. Medo-Persians are mentioned in the book of Daniel. The Greeks are mentioned. The one that's not mentioned will be the fourth power, which would be the Romans. But here's this perspective that we're going to see in the book of Daniel. Daniel. Some of these things Brother Ron mentioned, I'll mention them again, and then we'll go on and look at the text. In 640 B.C., the best king that Judah ever had became king at the age of eight, Josiah. And he was a demon. And in the 13th year of his reign, in about 627, Jeremiah began to prophesy. And part of Jeremiah's message was, you may not believe it, but if you don't obey God, there's going to come somebody from the north. Remember Jeremiah? We read that over and over. Somebody's going to come from the north and, and, and whoop you. And they're going to take people away captive. Well, at some point in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah identified, he says, it's going to be the Babylonians. And so Jeremiah was pleading with those last kings of Judah to submit to the God of heaven. He said, look, if you'll put your neck in the yoke of the king of Babylon, you'll survive. He said, now, now you're not going to be an independent nation. But your children and grandchildren, they won't be slaughtered and your nation will survive. That was Jeremiah's appeal. Somebody says, well, why would Jeremiah preach that? Because the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, and he preached. Well, in 609 B.C., Josiah died. And from that point onward, Judah was spiraling downward. There were four more kings after Josiah. Three were his sons, one were his grandson, and they were all wicked people. One of those kings is mentioned, or one of those sons, rather, the kings, is mentioned in the first verse of the book of Daniel. Look in Daniel chapter 1. And verse number 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, king Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon into Jerusalem, 
and besieged it. So, so this is the son. Josiah died. There was a son that was on the throne for three months. He was taken away. And then Jehoiakim. It was in the days of Jehoiakim. Brother Ron mentioned a moment ago that there were some different times that Jews were taken into captivity. Okay? In about the year 605, about 606, 605, the first group of Jews was taken into captivity to Babylon. And who's one of the well-known young males that was in that group? Daniel. A fellow by the name of Daniel. Okay. Daniel was taken into captivity along with many others. Let me read with you now. Let me continue reading. We'll come back and make some comments and catch up. But look at chapter 1. <coughs> Let me read verses 1 through 4, okay? Daniel 1, verse 1 beginning. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into Jerusalem and besieged him. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God, and the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children, the American standard says youths, in whom was no blemish but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. Just this note. We don't know the exact age of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah at this time. Many conservative minded Bible students would guesstimate that they were somewhere between the ages of 15 and 20. Now, just let me share this with you. In verse 4, that word children, or the New King James, I believe, says young men. That Hebrew word there uh, is translated different ways in the Old Testament. Uh, for example, uh, when Joseph, how old was Joseph when he sold into slavery by his brothers? 17. That word is used. Okay? That word is used. But that same word is used when David's seven-day-old child died. So what I'm saying is, that word is translated as young men or children or boys or whatever. It, it, it can have a wide range of meanings. But because of what the Babylonians had in mind for these men, for them to learn the language of the Babylonians, for them to be trained in the areas of science and all, they've already shown their ability, Many people guess somewhere around 15 to 20 years of age. So if you can picture in your mind someone whom you know that's alive right now, some of you had children that age. Yeah, somebody about that age. Towed it off to a place they didn't ask to go. And some of them were made eunuchs. And they certainly didn't ask for that. Okay? Now, let me backtrack a little bit and step out of our text. So, Jeremiah is giving this message about Babylon's power in the Middle East. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah for just a couple of moments. And if you want to turn left out of Daniel, you go through the book of Ezekiel and you run smack dab into Jeremiah. Let's find chapter 25. Chapter 25. Here's a message about Judah, which was the southern kingdom. And it's also a, nation, a, 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 a message about the nations that surrounded Judah. If you look in chapter 25 and verse 11. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon how long? 70, 70 years. So, so historically speaking, you're talking about approximately 
606 B.C. to 536 B.C. approximately, okay? 70 years. Somebody said, well, I've always heard the Babylonians, they weren't great people. Why would God let them get away with being ruthless? Oh, God didn't let them get away with anything. What's the next verse say? Jeremiah 25 and verse 12. And it should come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I'll punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity. So what God was going to do is he temporarily raised up the Babylonians. He used the Babylonians for his purpose. And then he turned around and did what? Punished them and brought them down. Now, stay in the book of Jeremiah if you don't mind. Look over in chapter 29. Now what we just read in chapter 25 was that 70 year period is named as the time of the Babylonians' dominance in the Middle East. Now then, after some of the Jews have been carried into captivity, Jeremiah wrote a letter. Wrote a letter to those captives. And the basic thrust of that letter was what? Don't you, get, don't you contact your travel agent and try to book a flight home next week. You're not coming home next week. He said, you're going to be there for the long haul. He said, build your houses, plant your gardens, your kids want to get married, just live your lives. Well, how long are they going to be there, Jeremiah? Look in chapter 29 and verse 10. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. And so that message was twofold about 70 years. Number one, Babylon's going to dominate the Middle East for how long? 70 years. Some of the Jews are going to be in captivity for how long? Stick with the winter. 70 years. And then God's promise is at the conclusion of 70 years, I'm going to visit you and bring you back home. Now, we're blessed because we have the rest of the Bible which reveals to us how God did that. In fact, we have in Daniel chapter 1, the very last verse in Daniel 1, the name of the ruler who allowed the Jews to go back to their homeland. What was his name? Cyrus. Cyrus. And so all of these things are coming together now. So Daniel, I, I want to mention something that Brother Ron mentioned. Daniel was taken into captivity with the first group of Jews that went into about 605 B.C. A few years later, in about 597, a second group of Jews were taken. And in that case, the Bible specifies there were 10,000. 10,000 Jews taken. And in that group was another man who served as a prophet. Who was taken in that second group? Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Now, Daniel, we learn in chapter 1, in Babylon, Daniel is going to have connections with the king's palace. Okay? We're going to see in Daniel chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar, the most mighty man in the world at that time, Nebuchadnezzar interacting with Daniel. Look at the very end of chapter 2 of Daniel. The very last verse, verse 49, talks about Daniel made a request of the king. But look at the last statement in Daniel 2, 49. But Daniel sat where? The king. Gave to the king. So, so Daniel's work oftentimes involved him communicating with the king. And when the Babylonians were overthrown and another empire came along, Daniel was still alive. He's communicating with the king. Now, Ezekiel wasn't like that. It doesn't mean that Ezekiel was a second-rate prophet or lower character. It was just a different task. It's like in the New Testament. Peter is described as being the apostle of the circumcision, and Paul was called the what? Also, the uncircumcision. Well, well, which one? It's not about who's better. It was one rule for Peter and one rule for Paul. Same thing here. One rule for Daniel and a different rule for Ezekiel, who worked among the common Jews who were there in captivity. Well, there was another prophet in those days, and we mentioned him a few times, and his name was Jeremiah. 
And Jeremiah was alive back home in 586 B.C. when the Babylonians came and finally flattened the temple and destroyed Jerusalem and took more folks into captivity. And here's what happened with Jeremiah. The Babylonian leaders who came to Jerusalem said to Jeremiah, it, it's your choice. If you want to go into captivity, we'll, we'll treat you well. Or if you prefer to stay here in your homeland, then, then you may stay here. What was his choice? Stay here. So you get these three prophets in the same time period in different locations fulfilling different roles. Daniel's over there with the Babylonians and later the Middle Persians communicating God's message sometimes to the king. you got Ezekiel working among the common Jews and you've got Jeremiah back home encouraging the folks back home. So what's in the book of Daniel? Well, you know it's got some history. If you look at our outline real quickly on pages 5 and 6, and uh, what was that first teacher's name? I've forgotten. It's been so long ago. Well, Brother Harrison was uh, encouraging us to give credit where credit's due. And so this outline, uh, except for a few tweaks, comes from uh, Brother Rex Turner. So if you look at this outline on page 5, the first major portion is Daniel's personal history. That's chapter 1. <laughs> and then the next section, chapters 2 to 6, is a historical section that's going to involve Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah and, and those dreams of Nebuchadnezzar. And then you look over on the next page, on page 6. We read this earlier. It's the apocalyptic <laughs> section where there are going to be visions and things. Now, let me just make this observation. I'm going to tell you up front, I don't get any kickbacks out of that. I don't get any financial compensation. But if you purchase a book in connection with your studies in the school, if you go to, if you go to Christian Family Bookstore that Brother Perry Hillis operates, if you go there and buy a book, a commentary on the book of Daniel, for instance, and you tell him that you're a student in the school, He'll give you a 10% discount. Okay? That doesn't work at Burger King. <laughs> He'll give it to you there. Okay? Now, every book written by humans has the potential to have some air. I'm going to mention a couple of commentaries on the book of Daniel that I found quite helpful. Uh, but remember, uh, they're written by humans and they could have some mistakes. So you have to do what? Compare it to what God says. One of those commentaries is the one here mentioned, well, it's not mentioned there, uh, Brother Rex Turner. Brother Rex Turner Sr. has a commentary, and I can give you that, but it's, it's what it is. Um, it's, it's quite costly. Uh, I bought mine many years ago. I, I'm guessing now, I'm just guessing, it sounds ridiculous, probably around $30. There's one that's about half that price that I think is quite good by Jim McGuigan. M-C-G-U-I. Hey, G, something like that. You'll get it. Now, do I endorse everything Brother McGuigan said about every topic? No. But he's pretty good on the apocalyptic literature. I think it, it's easy, easy to read. Easy to read. Okay? And if you want to pursue some other books, uh, you know, you can ask me about some other ones. Let me ask you this. It's not, a, it's not a quiz. Is Daniel mentioned in the New Testament? You got a 50-50 chance. Yes, he is. A couple times. When Jesus was speaking to the apostles about the signs for the coming destruction of Jerusalem, he said, when you see the abomination of desolation about which the prophet Daniel spoke Matthew 24, 15. So Jesus referenced Daniel in talking about the coming fall of Jerusalem. He's not mentioned by name in Hebrews 11. We know Hebrews 11 is about by faith, by faith and all that. And then there comes a point in Hebrews 11 where the writer leaves off the names and just mentions some circumstances. And he said, well, there are even instances where they shut the mouths of lions. Hebrews 11 and 33. Well, what comes, who comes to mind when you read that? Daniel. Daniel. So Daniel's mentioned directly as well as indirectly in the New Testament. Now, let's come back to Daniel 1. Now, I've already read the first four verses. Um, right out of the gates in the book of Daniel, 
you see God's heavy role, R-O-L-E, in this book. How is it that the Babylonians were able to conquer Judah? Any mystery there? God made it happen. Look at verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a fluke. It wasn't an upset. It happened. And the background of that was it happened because Judah was stubborn and refused to do what? Repent, return to God. Jeremiah had been warning, Zephaniah had been warning, and then the hammer came down. So what you'll see sometimes in the Old Testament, when God's talking about Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, he'll call Nebuchadnezzar and he'll say, he's my servant. When you study the book of Daniel, you'll see Nebuchadnezzar will say some nice things about Jehovah. But he's not committed to it. Right? He has his own gods, right? In addition to Jehovah. So what does that mean then that Nebuchadnezzar was God's servant? He did what God wanted done. God used him to carry out his will. To, 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 in this case, to punish Judah. Well, so in, in verse 2, the Lord gave Jehoiakim. Look at verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince or the chief of the eunuchs. And then verse 17. As for these four children, that is Hannah, Mishael, Azariah, and Daniel, God gave them knowledge. So, like I said, God is heavily involved from the get-go in the book of Daniel. He is the one who gave Jehoiakim into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar thought he was hot stuff, didn't he? Nebuchadnezzar's going to do that deal where he kind of, you know, Pat himself on the back and said, look at mighty Babylon. And you know who the architect of Babylon is, right? You're looking at him. God said, you know, I think it would be a blessing in your life if you'd go out there and live with the critters for a while. And so, pride goes before what? Destruction, haughty spirit, before Paul. You know, Nebuchadnezzar learned a lot of things, and some of them he learned the hard way. You know, we read there in verse 2 a moment ago, that they, they not only took some of the Jews, they took vessels out of the house of God. Now somebody, just assume we don't know. In the New Testament, the house of God is in reference to what? In the New Covenant? The church. Is that what it means here in verse 2? The house of God? No, it's not the church here. Context would indicate it's a reference to what? The temple. And so when the Babylonians came, they not only took Jews into captivity, they took some of the gold and silver instruments and vessels, and they came back and took another group and took one of those, and we're going to see in chapter 5. Chapter 5, on that night where Belshazzar's knees knocked because he saw that meaning, meaning, tickle you farce, they were having a drunken feast. What were they drinking out of? Those vessels of gold and silver that had been brought from the temple in Jerusalem. In ancient times, it was a common practice. If you go in and conquer a place, you loot their idols and bring them home and you show them off. And that shows what? My God's bigger than your God. Or my God's better than yours. And so they put those vessels. Should we conclude that Nebuchadnezzar's gods were, were bigger than Jehovah? No. Job made it have as a, a means of punishment. All right. So verse 3, some of, the, some of those who are the, the eunuchs or the king's seed. Okay? So what are they going to do with these young men? What's the plan for these young men who are, who are picked out? Okay? They don't randomly select, but here are men who have shown ability and, and knowledge. What are they going to do with them? Train. Go train. For whose purposes? For Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. Well, if you're going to communicate and be effective among us, you got to learn the language, son. So they're going to do all these things to groom them for their purposes. And according to verse number 5, 
How many years was this process going to involve? Three, Three years. Three years. They, they were given food and the names there, verse number six. You've not even heard me say those names you're used to saying, have you? I'm not against saying them. I just like the Hebrew names. Had I Mishael and Azariah. <clears throat> well, where did they get those other names? Like Abednego and Meshach and Shadrach. Where did those come from? Chaldean. Chaldean gave them those names. Just like Daniel had a new name, what was it? Belteshazzar. Yeah, look in verse 7. Daniel's new name is Belta. It's got a T-E in it, y'all. There's going to be a king named in chapter 5, a king of Babylon, who's going to be called Belshazzar without the T-E. And so it can be confusing. But if you have the T there in the middle, it's in reference to Daniel. Okay? Well, so the, the, the king, he wants what's best for these Jewish men in terms of getting them prepared to serve for his society. But look at verse 8. Boy, we can make some application here, y'all. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat or food, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now let me ask you this. Was there a potential risk involved in doing that? <clears throat> so what are you thinking? Daniel's just rolling the dice and saying, well, maybe today's my lucky day. Is that what you're thinking? I don't think so. Daniel purposed somewhere. Where did he do the purpose? In his heart. Reminds us there was a later in, in, in the history of the Jews when, when some of them went back to their homeland, there was a priest by the name of Ezra. Ezra purposed in his heart to do three things. Seek the law of the Lord. Do the law of the Lord and teach the law of the Lord. That, that, was, that was the kind of heart he had. Ezra 17. Seek the law, do the law, and teach. And in Daniel, in, in our common language, basically his message was what? I, I can't eat that stuff. Not that it's physically impossible, but if I eat that, that's going to cause me to be what? Defiled or unclean. Let's look at our booklet here, a couple of observations. And you may have something to add on page 8 of our booklet. And so as you can tell, sometimes we'll follow it, sometimes we won't, but I still want you to read it. Look on page 8 at uh, major point number 3, black point number 3. And under that, we've observed that, that Daniel demonstrated some knowledge. Why would we conclude that? That Daniel's choice demonstrated some knowledge. He knew right from wrong. He knew right from wrong. Now, well, remember this, y'all. Having knowledge, knowing what's right and knowing what's wrong, that's not a guarantee that we always will make the right choices. You agree with that? But in order to make the right choices consistently, we absolutely have to know the difference between what God accepts and what God doesn't accept. Woe to those who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Call good evil and evil good. Isaiah 5 and verse 20. And so, you know, application in our time, people in the world are stumbling. Some people in the church are stumbling because they're not familiar with God's word as they ought to be. And they put their stamp of approval on things that God detests. And they resist things that God endorses. Daniel had a level of knowledge. Our second thing there on number three, Daniel had conviction. What do we mean when we say conviction? Here's a person who's got conviction. What does that say about that person? I'm going to do what I think's right. Yeah. Here, I'm convinced that this is right, and, and that's why I'm taking my statement. Let me ask you something. Knowing what you know about Nebuchadnezzar, was he capable of going into a rage and just going off on somebody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He could fly off the handle, and sometimes that resulted in those people he was angry with losing their lives. 
We mentioned a moment ago, we read a moment ago in Jeremiah 29, Daniel wrote that letter to the captives. Down there in Jeremiah 29 and verse 22, it says that, that, that Nebuchadnezzar roasted some folks in the fire. <laughs> so Daniel basically, and, and those with him, food's put on the table, and basically the message is, the king says eat this stuff, and their message was, it's not happening. Don't you know nobody says no to the king? I don't mean to be disrespectful. I don't mean to be in your face, but I'm not going to eat that. Don't you know you can lose your life? Good. You mean, you mean I could die and immediately go and be with the Lord? Yourself so bad. Daniel's a man of conviction. He's a man of courage. He's like Esther. When Mordecai finally convinced Esther to go in and talk to the king, she said, if I perish, what? I perish. She, she wasn't flaunting it. She wasn't being haphazard. And, and then look at number five there under that list. You know, Daniel's a young man. And this example shows us it's great for older people. It's great for young. It's possible for young people to have their own faith and conviction. Not only, y'all, is it possible, Young people have to have their own faith, right? Well, we train them up from an early age and we just hope that there's going to come a time in their life and there's something that someone has suggested for them to participate in it and they know it violates the scripture. We hope they come to a point in their life where their response is, I can't do that, my mom and dad would kill me. Hope they mature way beyond that and say, you know what? I'm not doing that because it's wrong. Or maybe somebody's trying to keep them from doing what's right and they're saying, I'm absolutely going to do this, not because my daddy wants me to, but because my heavenly father says it's a thing. So, so Daniel, courage, knowledge, conviction. Look if you would near the end of chapter 1 because we're about out of town. So, so the king... So here's the request. They said, well, what are we going to do? You know, the fellow that's over the eunuchs, he's concerned about whose head? About his own. I can't go and change the menu. I'm going to have to answer for that. They said, all right, let's give us a 10-day trial. What's that lady's name? The Craig, the diet lady. What's her name? Jenny. Huh? Jenny. Jenny Craig. This is not a Jenny Craig thing here, y'all. He said, let, let, let's try veggies. For 10 days. Well, when they got done after 10 days, what was going on? They just skin and bones. No, fair and fatter. And did the king notice? Yeah. And the king noticed, if you look in chapter 1, verse 20, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding, if the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. He said they must have been homeschooled. <laughs> that God's blessings, right? And here's one of the things you learn in chapter 1, y'all. When God's people do what's right, God will bless them. That's what you see in chapter 1. Now, woo, look at verse 21. There's a name. Daniel continued even to the first year of which king? Sorry. See Babylonian? No. Oh, that's already Medo Persian. So what that tells us is, how long was Daniel in Babylon? At least how long? Seven years. Yeah, from the beginning of the captivity the all the way through. So later on, when we get to chapter 6, and it's the time of the Medo-Persians, and Daniel's tossed in the lion's den, if you're still coloring pictures with Daniel about 10 years old, that's way off. He may have been 85 or 90 years old. Seriously. Just think about somebody in your congregation. That's 85 or 90 years old. And the prospect is, you stop praying to God or you go into the lions. That's how old David was when that happened. Folks, my wife's husband has talked so much, we are out of time. And, uh, we cannot, I, I, the questions are really straightforward. If you would, I'll tell you what, let, let's do a couple together and get a good feeling, okay? A little teamwork here. On page 9, Name two prophets who were contemporaries with Daniel. Ezekiel. 
Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Fantastic. Number two. Daniel was taken into captivity about, B, I'll do the hard part, B.C. 606 or 605. And then number three, and you say, Brother Campbell, dispelling count. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. All right, y'all. Fantastic. Really appreciate you being here. And uh, be safe going home. There's a bunch of nuts out there. And we look forward to seeing you next time around, God willing. And we'll have some other folks next time as well. God bless.